Hello, welcome back. So in our continued um, adventures in state space, let's take a moment and try to um, present the system in a visual way. So if, if we go back to the idea of transfer function and specifically frequency analysis, at the time we had this thing called body plot that we could, as a function of frequency, plot how the system response looked like in terms of the magnitude and phase, something like this. And remember when we were talking about this system, a transfer function, we had a transfer function and we wanted to analyze the steady state response of the system to a periodic sinusoidal input. This was essentially the entire information we needed to describe the, the system, the output of the system. How much the magnitude changes and how much the phase of the response changes. So in a way, this was a complete and visualization of the system response. It was a little maybe unintuitive at the beginning because we needed to have some background to interpret what this means. But nonetheless, it was a very useful visualization to figure out how the system responds. So we want to do a, a kind of a similar thing. We want to visualize the response of the system, but in a state space form and um, the way we will see this is a way to kind of visual, visualize the entire possible behaviors of the system due to the initial condition. So I have this system, linear system, described by the equation x dot equals ax. And note here that I'm looking at only the natural response, so the response due to initial condition, and I have essentially zero input, so that's why I don't have this plus bu. So now that we are looking at this system, what is happening, for instance, in a two-dimensional or uh, second-order system, we are looking at a two-dimensional vector space of two state x1 and x2. So this is a vector. And you can think of this as my input vector, any of these points, x1 and x2, in this two-dimensional plane. Right now, I'm representing any of those with a vector, and these vectors cover the entire space. Through the transformation, by multiplying this vector by a, I arrive at the kind of output or transform the space, and any of these points is transformed to another point in the now x dot one and x dot two state a space. And a few properties of linear systems, obviously the grid of, if you imagine a grid on the input state is going to be transformed linearly. It, it may be skewed, rotated, but all the lines remain parallel. So any of these um, vectors can easily be mapped to another one in the output space. And I have highlighted just one of them. We, I, I don't even know what kind of transformation does it, but I, I suppose I, I can assume that this vector is transferred to that one, the purple one, maybe the next one is this, and so on. So the, the, the relative geometry of the shapes obviously remains unchanged. It may be flipped, rotated, or skewed, but the relative shape always remains the same. And so this is one way we can visualize this, obviously, but it's not super intuitive to know what is going on. So this shape that comes out could be due to a skewed version of the input space and also include a bit of rotation. So by just looking at it, it's hard to visualize what is happening in the system. But I can do a little interesting, maybe trick, 
to make things look nicer. So this is my X1 and X2 space. And let me, with the same color, take this point. This is the point of interest. And what I'm going to do, instead of using a separate space to show the transformation, I'm going to plot the same arrow in the location of the original point. So it's going to look something like this. So I'm plotting from the original point the vector that is transformed. And I can do the same, let me do a few more. So this one, this point, which is here, let's pretend it's this vector, so it's going to be a little down like that. And, well, it probably isn't the best visualization, but that's fine. So next one is this, which is about here. Uh, it would be this one, looking like that, and so on. If I keep plotting all these vectors, now you will start to see some patterns. So this one would be, I don't, I don't, I have lost track. So this one would be like this, and something like that, like this, like that. And I, if I extend this to other points in, on this space, I'll start to see an interesting pattern. So everything is going to look like this, probably a bit bigger. Something like that, maybe uh, a vector here, a vector there, a vector there, one here. So through this transformation, now I have visualized the system that tells me there is a kind of rotation or there is a pattern to the movement. So what this means, um, this visualization is called phase portrait. Phase portrait, and sometimes it is shown with, with these arrows, sometimes just the trajectory of the system. So what a phase portrait is, is in the dimensions of the state, state space, so x1 and x2, we are plotting the directions that the system is moving. The direction is defined by the derivative. So if, I'm at, is at, if I am at this point, my x1 and x2 are certain values, I know my system will move in that direction because those are the derivatives. So it's, it's a very small time after the current time. For instance, I'm going to be here. And then I, I can look at the next vector and then figure out I'll move to there and maybe from here I'll see I'll go there so as you can see maybe I can try it with a different color maybe red I can now try to plot the behavior of my system if I start from here I have a visual guide that tell me how the system will move in this state space vector, uh, state space field until if the system is stable, we will get to that, we will eventually converge to the origin. So this is a very powerful way to visualize the, the entire range of beha behaviors that the system can exhibit. I know from anywhere on this plane, I can, if I start from here, I can know how my um, behavior will evolve ev and eventually, in this case, come back to zero. So this rotational aspect that I'm plotting here is essentially governing the, the behavior of the entire system. And just as a kind of background, you can think of this is a second order system. So it could be a mass spring damper system. And this oscillatory and decaying behavior could represent an underdamped system. But we'll get, get to that in a bit more concrete way in the example that we'll show later. 
So this face portrait, just to recap, is a way to visualize the behavior of the system in the given state space. Maybe a few caveats that this system have, um, this visualization have. It works really nicely for two-dimensional or second-order systems like this. As you can see, we can very nicely visualize the system. It works well for uh, first-order systems as well. In this case, you only have one direction and your behaviors will be vectors along this direction. In 3D, you can easily show the, the this trajectory of the system in this state space, but visualizing the arrows is going to be a bit cumbersome. And obviously for the fourth order and above, you cannot completely visualize it. So you have to either only show a few dimensions or throw your hands up. Nonetheless, having this visualization is, in my opinion, very powerful and one of the most beautiful things in system dynamics, the concept of phase portrait. Okay, so that's that. Let me clean this to give some room. So, Let's look at a, a concrete example. And this is, all, as always, our famous mass spring damper system. So I have, let me do this. No, not, not an error. So I have that, this, a cart, mass, KB. So we already know the equations of motion for this system. M x double dot plus B x dot plus K x equals zero. I don't have input, so everything I do here is only the natural response. And if I want to take this to a state space form, I take the position and velocity as the state, so I have um, how do I write this? X1 and X2, which are, let me, let me change my, my notation so it's less confusing. Let's call these, I don't know, Y. So this is Y. So M Y double dot, B Y dot, K Y. So the state I, that I like to call them X is Y and Y dot, the position and velocity of the cart. And with that, I can write my state space D over DT of X1, X2, or X dot one and X dot two equals zero, one, times x1 and x2. So x1 is, x dot one is going to be, why did I write y? x2. So derivative of position is velocity. And here I have, so this have to go to the other side. So I have minus, minus k over m. Minus k over m and minus b over m. And this is the A matrix. And all we need to do to visualize this system is A matrix, right? So this transformation is completely defined just by the matrix A. And let's look at a few cases. So let's look at an undamped system. Undamped. In this case, B is zero. And my A matrix is zero, one, minus K over M, zero. 
And if I follow the same procedure, let me show it, maybe it is nicer. So this is my A matrix. And if I want to show you here, So this is the A matrix. I have taken the K and M parameters to be just one, both of them. So in this case, my A matrix is going to be one and minus one. And I'll get to these eigenvalues and eigenvectors later. And this is how the, the original state space and the transform version of it, the, X, the derivatives space look like. And I have highlighted one of the vectors as red and how it is transformed. And if I do the same procedure I did here, what I will left with is this very nice, beautiful rotation, rotation looking system. And it makes sense. So if you have a cart that is only attached to a spring, and if you move it from some initial condition, it will continuously go back and forth. And as the uh, system goes toward its end, end of its motion, it has only, uh, its velocity is zero and it has a lot of potential energy. And as it comes back toward the center, all the energy is transformed to kinetic energy. So at the, when position is zero, we have maximum velocity and velocity and position kind of change oscillation oscillate back and forth and the system never dies so this is how the the behavior looks like if i start from some random point on this space i keep rotating about these circles that are never getting closer to the origin or ne never getting further away and i just keep rotating and it is shown in this visualization Now, let me see if it's a good time to talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So maybe no, maybe I'll hold on to it. So this is for an undamped system. Let me go back here. Um, the second one, if it is an underdamped on under under damped system so in this case b let me rephrase this instead of b i'm going to write the damping ratio which was z and it is the relative ratio between uh, the damping of the system and critical damping so if z is bigger than zero but less than one, it is an underdamped system. And if you remember the behavior of the system, you started from some initial condition, it's an oscillation that eventually comes down to zero. So let me do, do this too. Oh, this one is dying. So in an undamped system, I have this, an oscillation that never dies. So in this case, I have an oscillation that eventually dies out with an exponential decay form. And now let, let me go back to my visualization. Now this is the same damping ratio. So let me start to increase it to 0.2. Now you see the transform system, the transform space is a little skewed. In this case, it, it has some rotation in it too. And now my, my face portrait looks a little different. So starting now, first of all, it, it is some kind of ellipsoid. And if you follow these, you will notice that they kind of tend toward the center. And this is the same form of behavior that if you see in my video, that shows this oscillation about zero, that eventually the system becomes, um, comes to a stop at the origin. If I 
keep increasing my damping ratio you see more and more of this effect this spiral toward the center getting more 0 0.6 0.8 so this has now become a very strong effect that everything is going to rotate and fairly quickly converge towards zero and something interesting happens at z equals one and remember this is what we call the critical damping when the damping ratio is one meaning that the damping of the system equals the critical damping and this was the kind of behavior that didn't show any oscillation and it was the fastest one that converged to zero and it is now visible here that if you follow these you will no longer see the rotation this line this behavior comes and approaches this zero and gets to the origin along these diagonal lines And let me stop this again. So that was the underdamp situation. We also saw the critical damp. And the last one is overdamp. Over overdamped when z is bigger than one. So in this case the system ah oh, this one is almost there. Doing this, doing that. A little bit of life so in this case the system will just very slowly converge to zero and in infinite time it, it only approaches zero and going back to here so if I now keep increasing this so my system becomes more and more damp and you can see that the oscillations have completely gone gone away and I, I starting from any point I just come here and converge to zero if I keep increasing you'll see more and more let me go a bit further more and more pronounced version of this now maybe it's a good time to look at the the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So when, when the system is overdamped, in this case, I have a matrix that in this massive spring damper system looks like that. And the eigenvalues are real. Both of them are negative. And I have two eigenvectors associated with it. And these eigenvalues and eigenvectors are very nicely go in, in the visualization. So remember, eigenvector is a direction that, eigenvector of a matrix, is a direction that the, if you put any vector and transform it, the vector remains in the same direction. So essentially, if you are, if you start from any point along these eigen vector directions you will see almost no no oscillation or any change in behavior and you just very nicely converge toward zero from those directions and the fact that the eigenvalues are negative means that you have these compressions everything is going to be compressed in those two directions and that that pushes the system toward the, the center if i keep decreasing this let me go to one that is kind of the the limiting situation when i have these eigenvector directions and my system starts and comes close to contact with these eigenvectors and 
again, because of the compression effect of the eigenvalues being negative, I tend to converge to zero. Oh, no, the other way. If I go into an underdamped situation, now my eigenvalues are complex. And remember, whenever we have a complex number, we should have a sense of rotation in the system. And this is what happens when eigenvalues are complex. The equivalent effect in this phase portrait is a rotational effect that, that is happening. And the eigenvectors, as it turns out, will be also complex, form a few directions. These are the, the vectors that describe the, the real and imaginary parts of it. So I have one vector that is 0.7 and minus 0.5, another vector 0 and 0.4, another vector 7 and minus 0.57, again same one, but I plot the opposite direction. And again 0 and minus 0.4. So these are all these four directions. And these eigenvectors define the shape of the ellipse that the system is essentially rotating about until it converges to zero. So you see the, the relationship between the shapes of the behavior and the eigenvalue and eigenvectors. Let me go slow, I'll make it undamped. And here, when we have just rotation, I have a pure um, eigenvalue. So it's a pure rotation. There is no real part associated with it. So there is no expansion or compression um, in, in these systems. And my eigenvectors, the real and imaginary ones are orthogonal and equal size. So I have these nice circular rotations. So in another interesting thing happens when the system becomes unstable. So if I make my Z negative, the system is no longer physical. So Z is the damping ratio, essentially a, an, a scaled version of the system's physical damping. And when damping is negative, means that as a, if, for instance, if the velocity is positive in one direction, kind of the damping is instead of um, trying to slow down the system, it pushes the system further out. So this kind of makes sense to make the system unstable. And this is what we see here. The eigenvalues are now have positive real parts, we, we get to those in the next lecture. That means the system is unstable. And now in, in the visualization of my face portrait, we very nicely see that these spirals are now converging away from the origin. And this indicates that if I start from any point, or just a spiral, a spiral, and the, the the area of that spiral keeps increasing and my system eventually blows to infinity with an exponential rate. And this is something I wasn't expecting, but interesting still, that when my damping is negative and is strong enough, it becomes too strong that prevents the system from oscillating at a kind of negative damping ratio, um, negative critical damping, my system will stop to behave like an oscillation and it just shoots up to infinity. I can make it a little bit more unstable, complete non-oscillatory behavior and from anywhere my response just shoots out and away from the zero. So as you can see by just looking at the face portrait, you can 
learn a lot about the system, whether the system has oscillatory behavior, you can predict if you leave the system from any initial condition, how it will behave, and whether the system is stable or unstable, all of those can come just by visualization of the face portrait. Okay, let me stop this. And just before my market completely dies, let me show you another example, second example, which is my mighty pendulum. So this system, remember, is nonlinear, and the equation of motion for this is in a rotational domain. I have theta double dot equals minus g over l sine of theta. So if I want to write it in a state space form, remember, a state space is not limited to linear systems. What I can do is take, let me write it this way, take my state, x1 to be theta, x2 to be theta dot. So in this case, d over dt of x1 and x2. I cannot write it in this nonlinear form as a, as a matrix transformation, but I can write it as two functions. So x dot 1 equals x2, and x dot 2 equals uh, what is it? Minus g over L sine of x1. And although this is not a, a matrix transformation, I can still do exactly the same thing. See where the x1 and x2 is. Do the transformation. Come up with x dot 1 and x dot 2 and then plot it the same way as I had here. And that is something I can show you next. And this is what I have. So again, I'm plotting the way at any point how the system will move or the direction of the system's movement from any initial condition. And you can see you get these rotations that are centered around the specific points. So the first one is centered around zero, which makes sense if you have the pendulum and you leave it, it will oscillate back and forth around zero. It never damps out because there's no damping. So it, is, it makes sense that my velocity and position just go about zero at, in, uh, forever. Interesting thing happens at a pi degree, so 90, um, 180 degrees. So I have this pendulum, I have flipped it upward. So at, at that exact point, it is actually a stationary or fixed point of my system. So if I'm precisely at 180 degrees and zero velocity, I will stay there. There is no arrow in any direction in this point. So if I leave my system there, it, it will move, um, it will stay there. But if I'm just a little bit off to the, maybe it's 180.001, so I'm a little bit further, now it will start to fall back and then rotate about two pi degrees. So this was zero, this was 180 degrees. So it is going to go and then oscillate about the, the two pi angle. So this can all be visualized. And another interesting phenomena. So in, for instance, you are, I don't know, at pi, de, pi degrees. So 180 degrees, you're up there. But you give it a very strong kick. So it just keeps rotating about forever and essentially your system follows this kind of 
pattern. It never rotates about a single point, just keeps, keeps rotating forever. And your angle keeps increasing. So you can visualize all of those. And the last thing I want to show you is the linearized version of this. So if I linearize the system, I'll have x dot 1, x dot 2 equals, so it's going to be x2 and minus g over l x1. This is the linearized version. And I can write it in a matrix form, which is going 0, 1, minus g over l, 0, x1, x2. And now I can show the phase portrait of this linearized version as well. And this is the last thing I'm going to show you. And it is down here. So it's the same phase portrait. I have just zoomed in between minus pi and pi. And the blue one was the original one up there. And the red one is a phase portrait of the linearized system. As you can see, maybe I can zoom in a bit further. So the, if my angle and angular velocities are very close to zero, that's the point that I linearize the system about, the, the linear and nonlinear systems behave almost exactly the same. But you will start to see slight differences between the linear and nonlinear one. And I, if I keep zooming back out, you will notice the difference becomes bigger, maybe that's too much, bigger and bigger, and somewhere maybe at angles of more than, I don't know, this is 60 degrees, and velocities that are bigger than, I don't know, point about four, the differences becomes very large and to the point that at pi degrees the nonlinear system wants to go in one direction but the linear one pretending it, it is now a, a spring pulling it back wants to continue the same it was doing before so continue doing these single spirals instead of the multiple spirals about different points so this becomes quite a mess. So this is also a way you can very compactly compare how the linear and nonlinear versions of a system works by just looking at a single graph to um, explore all possible val uh, values of initial conditions and system behavior. Okay, so I have in one board, that's I think the first time we covered everything in one board, we introduced the concept of phase portrait, how we can visualize the behavior or a natural response of a linear and also a nonlinear system in this, with, with the same concept, compactly in just one figure. And this tells us a lot about the behavior of the system, whether we have rot rotation, rotation about center or a non-oscillatory behavior, or whether the system is stable or unstable, or in general, how the behavior looks like from any given initial condition. So what we will do next is extend all of these ideas a little bit more and look at the stability and its relation to the properties of matrix A. We quickly touched on it that it, it is related to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the system, but we will expand more on that. And with a few more items about the um, vibration or frequency analysis, I think that's all we wrap up the state space uh, analysis. So 
Stay happy until death.